All right, good evening, everybody. It's Mike here, and I'm with my good mates, Dr. Dom. Dom, how's it? Yeah, how's it, Mike? Good to be back. Yeah, um, so um, I think a lot of the trends with these webinars is to have a video of the two speakers in the top right corner. Um, Dom hasn't had a haircut yet, so we decided, I put my best shirt on, but Dom, you didn't have a haircut as we suggested you should. So no, gonna, but you've had a haircut. I've had a haircut, so yeah. we're, going, we're going without video, so I hope everyone knows what we look like. Um, well, the way we've got it, we've got Dave sitting out right next to us. Dave, how's it? Hi, Mike. He's the producer in the background. He's going to be fielding um, questions in the chat room. Um, and we've got a little bit of a quiz uh, scenario going a bit later, so he'll, he'll play a role in that. Um, if you have any problems with uh, technology or sound, um, pop it through in the chat room. And um, we're going to try and keep this going quite swiftly. We've got quite a lot of content to get through. Um, and we're, we're excited to, to be wrapping up the, the Pelagic series. This is the, the last of the Priscilla the cellar reforms um, and maybe one day Dave will do the um, Jagers and Gannets and, and goals for us. Dave, how about that? All right, so let's get started. So um, part three and then um, welcome back again, Dom. Yeah, um, so fun. Dom, um, as we all know, is, is very prominent now in birding circles. He's um, a recent author of, of the Sassel fifth edition and you've come through a, a whole long series of webinars on, on launching that. How's that been, Dom? <laughs> Yeah, I feel that's what I've been talking about for the last uh, three months. So we can skip over the slide pretty quick. Okay, so we don't need to talk about Dom too much. And then um, we sent out an email. So some of you listening now may not have uh, got the email with the, um, the, the quiz. Um, we, we sent you um, some questions. We asked you to identify these four species. So um, we, we had quite a bit of fun looking at the results. I had to um, put the results in um, around about an hour ago. So there might be some responses that we haven't yet seen. Um, but essentially, we've got uh, four pelagic birds and um, all four species of birds that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so it'll be quite nice for us not to reveal the answers right now, but we'll reveal them at the end. And yeah. you can see if you've learned anything from the webinar to help you with the idea of these birds. Done some really, really crap photos from you again. <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah, again, so as I said before, these, these pics are taken with quizzes in mind, so you can't get too, too sharp a photograph to okay. Yeah, because that, that, that top left one, um, you, you had a perfect um, sharp one for me, and I threw that away and you sent me something slightly less, um, less sharp. Okay, so um, we asked you to categorize yourselves as, as pelagic birders, um, so never been to the ocean before, walked along the beach and seen a few gulls and terns. Um, looked at us through a scope and seen some seabirds out there and wondered what they were. I'd love to get closer. Um, you've been on one pelagic trip and you might have seen an albatross before. Um, you've been on quite a few pelagic trips and you consider yourself reasonably experienced. And then obviously the top of the pile is uh, you're a guide. So when you filled this one in, Don, what did you classify yourself as? <laughs> I'm hoping the bottom one. Um, so quite a nice even spread. Obviously not too many guides that, that completed. We had 67 responses and that was about an hour ago. Um, and, and most people fitting in the category, the, the green and the purple, which is people that have got quite a strong interest in pelagic yeah. birds, which is great. And you'd expect people watching a webinar on pelagic birds to, to have an interest. All right, so this was the, the first bird we showed you. And um, the choices we gave were, it's, it's a sheer water, no, no prizes for that. Um, the choices were Manx, Tropical, Little, Subantarctic, and Balearic. And these are, it's a really tricky family, eh, Tom? Yeah, it is. And, uh, and just to reiterate, um, this is basically your phone a friend option here for the for the for quiz. The quiz yes. It doesn't necessarily mean that the answer that is, is the Manx shear water. That's not necessarily the answer. That was the that was the popular vote. Yeah. So bear in mind, this bird we are not going to reveal what it is right now, and you can look at the the spread of answers and see um, what you think, and we will we'll come back to it a little bit later. So that was the spread. Um, no one went for. Um, Balearic, because most people wouldn't even know what a Balearic shearwater looks like, and we will talk about Balearic. Um, and then uh, this was the second one, so uh, maybe slightly easier, um, a slightly sharper shot from you, Dom. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was all. Mozambique somewhere. Okay, so once again, um, there are five choices, uh, white-bellied, black-bellied, grey-backed Wilsons and Swinnows, um, and those are the choices by um, those that responded, so not necessarily um, the 55.2% being the right answer. Okay, and then um, this is bird number three. Um, and once again, um, it's a shearwater. Um, the popular choice was flesh-footed shearwater, but some options for wedgies. Um, there's also a, a great shearwater that was chosen there. 
um, and sooty and, and a short tailed as well. Okay. All right, so that's um, bird number three uh, or C. And then um, this was bird number four. Um, it's a clearly a storm petrel. Um, most people opting for the Wilsons. Um, and um, we've got um, some other options there as well. All right, so before I go into the next slide, what we've asked, we're gonna ask you to do um, is we're gonna ask you to put Dave's cell phone number in your, your phone. Um, and we want you to send us a WhatsApp um, labeling the birds A, B, C, and D. And the first person to get the answer right will, will win a copy of um, the new Sassel fifth edition. So Vince Ward and Trevor Hardacre are disqualified um, by the mere fact that they won the last two challenges. So everybody else is fair game. But we, um, we'd still be interested to see your... Uh, yeah, your, so, uh, so Trevor and ABC Vince, and if, yes, if you're watching, I, well, Trevor, we know you're watching, I'm not sure if Vince is on, um, send us your ABCD and let's see how, how sharp you are. Um, and you can even compete with your friends, see if you're quicker than them. Because I imagine if we don't have a winner, we can revert to... Yeah, yeah we can do that. Correct. So um, if, if we don't have a clear winner, um, and then, uh, then Trevor or Vince, you may, may take a second book home and you can give it to um, your lovely uh, wives, I think. All right, so if you could maybe send us a, send David, you can start now actually, but we're only gonna reveal the answer right at the end and the winner. Okay, all right, so I think in the, in the blurb beforehand, I said we would, we would do a little bit on, on pelagic bird photography. So um, I've been fortunate enough to have been out a number of times on, on pelagic trips. Um, Dom, this was a trip that you and I were on together. Yeah, it was an amazing trip. And I think that's, I love this shot. It really just captures the, the scene perfectly, just seabirds everywhere. Um, and that's the really trawler, why, pulling yeah, its that's why you go out on these pelagic trips is to find the trawlers and just enjoy the, the chaos yeah. and look for those rare birds. And we had a former and a gray-headed petrel. Uh, uh, yeah. on this, on this so maybe just to to make everyone feel comfortable, Dom and I were not um, sitting on a on a floating tube taking a photo off from the, the water. We were actually on a second boat. So yeah. um, re really nice to be out uh, with two boats looking for really good stuff. All right, so I I'm going to try and go quite quickly through the photography. And once again, photography is very much a, a subjective thing. Everybody has their own way their own way of doing things. And these are some of the things that I've learned over the years, and I'm very, very far from, from knowing exactly what I'm doing. Um, but just I thought I'd give some, some quick tips. All right, so when you're on a, on a boat, um, most of these pelagic birds are moving very quickly. Um, and your, your chances um, of getting them in focus are, are quite slim because they are so quick. Having said that, um, on a good trip like the one we had um, yeah. a couple of weeks back, um, there, there is just, it's not like going... Um, into the bush vault and trying, trying to take photographs of birds where you might aim your camera every now and again. You literally have um, endless options to photograph birds because there are generally so many. Yeah, and it's often a, too many birds around. It's actually often difficult to focus on one individual bird, like, yes. like prawns. You give these big flocks of them coming by. And, and, and the one that whizzes past you, you think, well, that would have made a great photo off and you get yeah. ready for the next one and it's already gone past. So, um, so generally you get good chances at, at uh, birds, but um, the fast moving shear waters are really, really tricky and we'll talk about those tonight. And then sometimes you get birds um, sitting very nicely on the water and those are, are the, the great opportunities where, where you can get really close to the birds and sometimes um, a long lens actually doesn't help you, you want something a little bit um, shorter. Um, so we've just got um, some drawing on the screen, um, just if I can clear all drawings, if you can uh, trying to just make sure that people don't draw on the screen, but if you can just remember not to annotate. Okay, there we go. All right, and then... And you know, even though you do give these birds sat on, sat on the surface, it's not, actually not always the easiest shot, because you gotta remember that you're bobbing around also up and down all the time. And if you, if you look through all your photographs, you've often cut off the head or the tail. The tail. Uh, so it's actually, I mean, that's a lovely shot and it's not as easy as it might seem. So just maybe to tell you all, this is a Southern former, that's an Antarctic prion, and this is a Southern Royal Albatross. Um, and then obviously the equipment, your, your lenses um, and your, your camera body are critical. You, you need a fast lens. You need something that's going to be able to focus quickly because the birds move very fast um, and you need to lock on to the birds as, they, as they're flying around. And so you, you want to be able to spend a bit of money on a, on a decent lens. And, and the, the greater the focal length, um, the tougher it is to handle at sea. And Dom, that's the point you were making. If you're trying to take photographs of, of Southern Royal Albatrosses with a 500 
when it's only 10 meters away, you can, you can end yeah. up in a bit of trouble. All right, so, and, and it's, it's useful to have a zoom lens because you, you have these opportunities with these, these white-backed albatrosses. Um, the, the one in the foreground is a southern royal and the one in the, in the background is a black-browed. Um, and then very soon thereafter, you'll have these um, Wilson storm petrels, which um, clearly I didn't have enough focal length on this one. Um, but yeah, the, the lenses can are... Be an ID shot. <laughs> can we use that as an ID shot? It's a Wilson storm petrel. So um, I've used um, 100, 400. I've used a 300 fixed. Um, I've, my, my son there on the right-hand side, Adam, he's using a 400 millimeter fixed. Um, and, and I now use a 500 millimeter fixed. And um, a warning about the longer the lens, the more likely you are to, to get seasick if you have the tendency. Yeah. So try to stay away from long lenses if you get seasick. And in fact, if you want to go out on a pelagic trip and you're worried about seasickness, then maybe leave the camera um, stowed at the bottom until you know you're in good shape. All right, so that's uh, me enjoying some great birds out there. Tripods and monopods are absolutely useless at sea. So yeah. leave those behind. They just clutter things up. And um, you, you should have a good strap attached to your camera and your, and your lens. And um, you need it tethered to both because we have a good mate, Cliff, who was out on a pelagic trip and his, um, his camera body uncoupled from his lens and the lens was attached on a strap, but the camera body wasn't. And um, that lens, that, that camera body is now sitting at the bottom of the, <laughs> of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and I, I hope Cliff doesn't mind me telling that story, but there was a lot of pain because I think he had some really good shots <laughs> on the camera and no one was offering to jump out and dive for it. And then um, take memory cards with plenty of space because you'll come back with a ton of photos that... Habitat shots. Habitat shots that, yeah. that look like that. Um, I've got plenty of those. <laughs> the settings, I suppose this is the most important thing when you're photographing at sea. Um, it's personal preferences. So I know people who shoot shutter speed priority, they, they put their, their shutter speed at 2,500 and they let the aperture adjust or, yeah. or the ISO. Um, I generally um, photograph um, aperture priority um, and make sure that I'm getting two and a half thousandth of a second. Um, if I'm not, then I'm going to ramp up my ISO. In nice sunshine, you're going to get, I mean, you can see this, this black broad, um, the, the, the shutter speed here is one eight thousandth of a second at 500 ISO. Um, and so you're getting plenty of light and you want that good light and that fast, um, fast shutter speed in order to freeze um, the wings. Um, sometimes it's nice to get the effect with, with yeah. wings that are not um, frozen but most of the time you're looking for these sharp images. So um, if light is good, and, and this is what happens as the day wears on, you can start actually um, closing your aperture a little bit. And the reason you want to do that is because you've got a greater depth of field and it gives you a little bit more room for error um, when you're focusing on, on the eye of a bird and it might not be absolutely sharp if you don't get it quite right. Yeah. So okay. with those birds moving so fast. All right, and then um, exposure and metering um, and, and ISO. So ISO, I've, I've spoken very briefly about ISO. If you, if you want to um, make sure you get that 8,000th of a second or at least 2,500th of a second, you might have to bump up the ISO. And then one of the things I've learned is that um, blown whites on a, on, a, on a bird photograph are, are useless. Um, so you want to stop down. You want to make sure that you, you stop down. I sometimes stop down almost a full stop sometimes even one and a third stops um, because an overexposed photo is useless, whereas an underexposed photo you can often, um, you can often lighten yeah. and, and you don't lose the detail in the whites. I guess the vast majority of pelagic birds are pale to some extent. Yeah, so. well, the most difficult thing is many of them are black and white. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you're getting, um, the, the camera's reading a lot of the black and so it's increasing, um, increasing the amount of light yeah, the camera wants to bring in light, yeah. and then the whites get blown. So you want to almost tell the camera to not let in as much light as it's telling you to yeah. let in. And then a big issue at sea is whether you've got the, the sea in the background of the bird or you've got the sky. When you've got the sea, the camera is saying, I need to let in more light and the, the whites get blown. And then obviously with the sky behind, it's, it's trying to let in less light and you often get these underexposed shots, which, which I, I think are always a lot better. So this, I mean, the, the top bird is a, a, a southern um, giant petrel and the bottom one is a northern giant. Um, they look very similar, actually. I was just about to ask, <laughs> it's the same individual. No, it? it's a different bird. Um, <laughs> it's a different species. Yeah, so the, the bottom one has got the orange tip to the, the bill, which is, is northern, and then the top one is the greenish tip. Um, you can see just the different effects you get, whether the sky is behind yeah. or whether the, the dark blue ocean is. Right, and then um, your focal points. 
are critical. Um, and you want to find the, the, the combination that works best for you. I often go with a single point, um, but sometimes it's better to go with, with a number of points activated so that it can pick up the bird as it flies into the shot rather than you having to get the point exactly on, okay. on the eye. That's that's not a pelagic bird, just as a matter of interest. This is a, a, a gyro falcon. I think we, we agreed. It's definitely not my photograph, um, and someone might correct me, but it's obviously a, a falconer's bird because it's got those tassels on the leg. All right, and then um, when you process and, and crop, um, I'm, a, I'm a very big believer in giving the bird space, and so this is a very poorly cropped um, Antarctic prime, um, whereas I much prefer um, the bird having a lot of space to fly into. Once again, cropping um, and composition is a completely personal thing. Um, I like a lot more space, but um, some people like to crop a lot tighter. Um, but this, for me, works better in the, in the second version. And then um, processing whites. Um, you must always make sure that you get some detail in the white feathers of the birds. Um, so you, you can see that Southern Fulma, um, the top photo, all those white feathers on the, on the breast of the bird are are lost in terms of detail, whereas that bottom photo you can see that um, subtle um, feather feathering coming through on on the on the breast of the bird, and, and it creates a much more um, sort of real image. Yeah, and I guess once you've got that pure white, you've essentially got nothing to work with. Correct. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Process, yeah. So this southern former, the whites were not blown because I underexposed. Yeah. Um, so I could recover the whites and, and and make sure that that they were not lost because blown whites have no feather detail. Yeah. All right, and then and rarities. So a great reason to take your camera out to see is um, if you should happen to see something very unusual. Um, this was a bird we picked up um, on, on a pelagic trip a few weeks ago. This is a gray-headed albatross, that bird sitting in the middle. And our first views of it were, were very quick and we got some very quick shots and then made sure we knew what we were looking at. Um, and then we spent a lot of time trying to find it. And um, it's always good to, to have a photo of these really cool rarities because then when you get back to shore you can send all your mates <laughs> photographs of it and you can gloat a bit. Um, and then Dom, the very last point I'm going to make on photography this evening is that um, photographs help you separate primes. Well, it's the only way to separate primes. Well, in the hand. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. And sometimes even photos do yeah. allow us to do that. All right, so I just wanted to do, do a quick, um, a very quick run through it. I wouldn't call it a masterclass because a masterclass should be given by a master, but um, just I hope those points are, are useful. Um, I know it was quite quick, but we, we've got much more important content to get through. Um, so Dom, I'm going to let you talk in a second, I promise. Okay. But I'm just going to recap. This is where we, we started the last time. These are the tube noses. These are the birds we've dealt with in these um, webinars. We've, at the end of today's webinar, we will have covered every single recorded bacillary form species that has been um, in South, South, Southern Africa. Yeah, that's great. Um, so these are the, the various categories, the great albatrosses, mollymorks, giant petrels, gadflies, the fulmarines, primes and blue petrel, bulwarius, sort of bulwarius, Priscil priscillaria, shearwaters and storm petrels. So those bottom two are the ones we're dealing with this evening. Yeah, it's quite a broad, quite a number of birds to get through. Yeah, so we, we've done well to get this far um, and let's, uh, I think, keep going. Yeah. And that's just a slide that indicates the relative sizes of, of the birds we're talking about. So we're dealing with the shearwaters tonight, which are sort of a medium sized um, uh, sort of pelagic bird. And then obviously the storm petrels are, are the really little ones. Okay, Dom, I think it's time for you to, to do some talking. So okay. we've got uh, a bunch of shearwaters there and we've um, categorized them by rarity and status. Yeah, so I mean, heading out to sea, so we've, uh, number one is the, the most common birds there. So Cory is great and Sooty we've called as number ones. Um, and then on most of your uh, Cape Pelagic trips, you should come across those, uh, if it's a summer trip, you should come across those fairly easily. And, um, and then getting things, you know, maybe a little tougher, like um, a bank share water, heading out past the point. And then we've got a bunch of rarities and all the way down to like one, two, or two one or two records. records. Yeah, so what's that? Street, Short Town, Valeric, Shearwaters. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, we'll go into a bit more detail. So just so um, you all know, we're not going to cover the really rare stuff in great detail because I think most people who head out to sea are going to be wanting the, the key pointers on the birds they're most likely to see. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll touch on everyone, 
but uh, we'll spend more time on the more common one. Yeah, and I think if you if you get to know your really common birds really well, correct, you'll then be able to pick out of it something different, and that's when you you photograph the bird and and really study it in detail and you know, figure out how to tell the Wilson from a band run Absolutely. or something like that. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of these birds we're going to talk about tonight, um, the sad bit is that sometimes it's only going to be revealed in a photograph because a lot of these shear waters fly by so quickly. Yeah. You might aim your camera, fire off a few shots, and then have to look and see whether it's it's a it's a little or a, a subantarctic or a manx or a tropical. Yeah, and I guess that's the way birding is going in general nowadays. Um, unless you've got the shots. <laughs> no one believes you. you know, no one believes you, and you often maybe doubt yourself afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of you may not know, but the storm petrels we get here are separated into, into two broad groups. There's the austral storm petrels, which is Wilson's black-bellied, white-bellied, grey-backed and white-faced. And those are typically sort of um, deep south birds. Yep. And then the northern storm petrels, which are generally the migrants, or, or they, they occur in sort of warmer climes and maybe some, some Mediterranean climes as well. So, yeah, and tropical waters also. Tropical waters, yeah. So um, we'll, we'll deal with all of those. Let's start with the shear waters. And, and maybe just before I go on, um, you'll have noticed um, we're crediting some of our good friends who've contributed a huge number of these photographs. Yep. I did okay with the albatrosses. I did okay with the petrels, yep. but I had very few photos of shear waters and storm petrels. Yeah, so. these birds are either very, very quick or very, very small. Yeah. So I don't know if I contrib contributed any photographs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thanks to you know Neil Perrins and who, who sent me tons of uh, photos and Trevor. Um, thanks to all of you, and then I've scraped quite a few off the internet because there just aren't that many good photos of some of the birds we're dealing with. All right, so Dom, um, Corey Shearwater, this is a bird you'd expect to see on a summer pelagic. Yeah, so arriving from about November to, I imagine, May, when we said yeah, October to May. So it's a, a northern hemisphere breeding bird, so most breed off the um, off west coast of uh, west of West Africa and then make their way down, make their way down to our waters in summer. And um, what really stands out here, it, it, it's a pale shearwater. Yeah. So there's not too many of them around. And it's got this pale bill, yeah. this uh, creamy, pinky, orange bill, yeah. which really stands out. And most of the shearwaters we're going to cover today, except for the sister species of this, um, show the, the darker bills. So like a great shearwater, uh, which I think, we'll, I think we'll discuss in more detail. I mean, uh, my, my life, uh, um, Corey's was actually from, from a land-based pelagic, and they're yeah. birds you can see off, off headlands in, in summer. They, they yeah. come through in quite large rafts. And it's a bird that you, you should um, pick up and you've assigned a, a status of one. Um, so if you get out there, and it's a very pretty bird, actually. So yeah. It's an attractive um, pelagic species. And I mean, I guess the thing to consider with these shearwaters, they, so you're almost built to, to swim under the water. So these birds are diving up to 20 meters in a quarry shearwater. And the, the sort of shearwaters are going, I think they've been recorded up to 70 meters yeah. deep. So, you know, so they're flying, they're not like albatrosses, which can go, you know, for probably hours without flapping if there's decent wind around. But these birds are flappers, so they flap, 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 yeah. glide. And then they're finding little patches of, of um, where, the, where the fish have been drawn to, you know, drawn to the surface by dolphins or whales below. It. And then they're going in, you know, hitting these, these shoals. So that's when they really it's come to the fore. So they it's almost the um, you know like like the ulcers you get in normal yes, yes, yes. really a, um, good deep divers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think um, Dom touched on on the flight um, sort of habit of these birds is they they do flap their wings um, a lot. So it's the flap flap glide, yeah. Um, as opposed to some of the larger petrels and, and the albatrosses, which do a lot of um, just gliding. These birds you see over the surface of the water flying. Yeah, and right. then like you know, it's not a confusion uh, species yet, but like a white and petrel can be confused with a flesh footed shearwater until you actually watch them fly. Yeah, and you see it's it's quite a different flight, much, much more lazy flight. So, I mean, we, we've spoken about the prominent features here. It's a, it's a yellow bull. Um, it's, a, it's a very pale bird. Um, and we are going to put Corys with um, Scopoles. Yep. Um, so Scopoles is a confusion species. And, and I think Scopoles has probably been underreported over the years. Um, and yeah, it's a relatively so we, recent split as well. Yeah, it is. So we don't have any confirmed records for South Africa yet. Um, there's been a few birds photographed off, uh, off Namibia. Namibia. Yeah. But I think as far as I'm aware, that's the only um, records we have so far. But they are, they have been radio tracked um, into, well, not, not radio tracked, but they have been tracked using GPS into um, 
the Vivian waters uh, do come here quite regularly. So we'll mention it here in this, um, and once again, amazing um, contribution from Francie to, to these webinars. We're using the, the plates from, from Sassel 5. Um, the key feature here separating um, from Scopoli's is the, the, the all dark primaries in, um, in the quarries, and, and we'll come to some shots here, but these are just some uh, beautiful photographs just showing the nature of the quarries, um, lovely looking birds. Um, and, and now we move on to Scopoli. So we've mentioned that it's a, it's a, it's a very um, irregularly recorded bird in our waters, um, but the key feature you'll see is that the, the primary bases have got white in them as opposed to yeah. those dark bases. And it's a very subtle feature. I mean, you can photograph um, Corey shear waters and uh, in the right light, it can appear that they are pale based, the primaries, um, but you probably, that's why it's difficult to get an idea of one photograph. So if you then take a series of photographs, you should see that it's, you know, it's not actually pale based and it's dark and it's a Corey's. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you'll see from the photographs coming up, it can that, be quite that's subtle. my problem is I can't see the photographs coming up. Somehow no, really. our slides have gone. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe let's concentrate on this particular photograph and you can see. Yeah, um, so you can just about see the pale, the bases, pale, pale there. bases here. Um, and, and I think, um, uh, so our good friend Rob Leslie, um, he spent some time on a ship in, and this is his photograph. Um, spent a lot of time. He spent a lot of, you know, he got stuck on a ship um, during COVID, during the, the lockdown five. And I think he, he felt he was going to be on a ship for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, which gave him a lot of opportunity to photograph um, birds like the Scopoli's shearwater. And um, Rob, um, thanks very much to Rob for this photo. But he, he said he sent me a couple of photos and, and the amount of whites in those primaries is, is very variable. So yeah, it's... he had a lot of birds which he was absolutely convinced were Scopoli's, but then a lot which um, it was just too subtle to, to be absolutely certain. Um, so this bird, you can see it actually is relatively subtle. But certainly white in the base of those, those yeah. primaries. And I reckon it's, it's a matter of time until we get one for South Africa. Yeah. Um, they, they come down, you know, right down to the Orange River just about. And another great reason to to have a camera on board is to to photograph quarries and, and try to pick one up. Yeah, I mean, I think before you would be, you know, almost guessing yeah. whether, as to whether you had one or not. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so um, there's a great paper written by Dylan Vassipoli from Birding Eco Tours. Um, if you just search Corys versus Scopolis, um, this particular article goes into a huge amount of detail. It's got some amazing shots as well. So um, I, I certainly can't talk at too much length about it because it's it's quite uh, voluminous, but a very good article to to look at for those two particular yeah. species. Yeah, and I think he's, he's summed it up quite nicely and, and shown a whole bunch of photographs comparing yeah. the two. So it's, uh, I see some of those photographs are actually yours. Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then um, I guess this is probably our most common um, shearwater. Well, sooty shearwaters are most common, but in summer, um, these great shearwaters come through in huge numbers and they, they really are attractive birds. Yeah. Right? So they come from uh, Tristan de Cunha in, in the islands in that archipelago. And I mean, like it's we went down, out. Down here in uh, sort of the yep, southwest. That's it, yeah. And we went out, you know, two months ago and didn't get it, didn't get any of them. So they, they arrive in our waters from about September, October. That's right. And um, so, I mean, superficially resembling a Cory's or Scopoli shearwater. But if you look, it's got that dark or black, almost black cap um, and that white collar. It really contrasts the, the, the dark cap with the white pine collar. Uh, and that really stands out. And then there's a bunch of other features yeah, here. The dusky belly patch is, a, it looks like it's been lying in a, in a patch of oil. Yeah. We'll, we'll come to some. Photos now, another feature that I've always found very noticeable when you see the birds, particularly the upper side of the bird, is these um, very scalloped um, sort of upper wing and, and mantle and back. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's quite a scallop bird. It almost reminds me a little bit of a ruff, yeah. you know, the, the patterning on the back. And with a bit more wear and tear, they get even paler, yeah. you know, even whiter. All right, so here are some of the features. Uh, once again, thanks to John and Trevor. Um, the, the dark belly patch. Um, is a, a very nice feature and it looks like it's been misbehaving with that, um, that, that smudge. Um, and then obviously, um, Dom has mentioned that dark cap and it's separated from the, the mantle by that, that white hind color, yeah. which gives it a, a more pronounced um, cap-like look about it. And could it almost be mistaken for the extremely rare pale morph of wedge-tailed shearwater? Yeah. But it's got the white rump or white um, It's got that white crescent in yeah, the, in the which a uh, wedge tail doesn't have. And that's uh, the scalloping that I was really talking about. It's it's quite a, you know, it always looks quite worn as opposed yeah. to a very uniform. And you've got a, a pale carpal yes. bar there from the, um, it's lost feathers, so it's busy growing feathers there, you can see in the primaries. 
So a very tatty looking bird, but it, it does show the features quite well, particularly that, that dark cap and the, and the white hind collar separating yeah. the cap. Right, so that's great shear water. And I think, um, um, as you say, if you do a winter pelagic, I know they had one um, on a winter pelagic uh, a few weeks ago, but it was literally one bird um, in amongst all the others. Um, but if you go in September, October, I know I've been on pelagic trips at that time of year, where they are just um, literally everywhere you look, you, you get great shear water. Yeah, somewhere. and they're nice to see alongside quarry shear water, Great. which uh, you know they could be mistaken for, but once you see them alongside each other, yeah. you realize there's no problem there. Okay, this is the, the most regular occurring um, shear water in our waters, and um, also a bird that's very easy to see um, off a land based pelagic watch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a very attractive bird, very fast flying. A typical flat flap glide from my experience um, and yeah, a, a bird that you you would see all throughout the year um, even close to shore particularly when there's been a bit of a front to come through. Yeah I mean it's interesting that you get you seem to get them in the first few kilometers as you head out to sea then once you hit the trawling grounds you seem to lose them yes. and as you go much further off like onto the oceanic waters you don't really see them so it's more of a a, a continental bird yeah. and um, that's why you do pick them up and quite regularly on your sea watches yes, from, from, from land. Um, they do come in very close to the coast. So it's it's always, um, if you go out on a pelagic trip with um, with new pelagic uh, birders, um, it's likely the first bird they see alongside a watch and petrel. Yep. Um, and it's always a great comparison because it, it really highlights the different flight patterns of the two sort of families. Um, but the silvery under, un, underwings is really a key feature. And, yeah. and there are a few birds that have that much lightning under the wings that, that seem to flash as the birds turn. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you catch it in the nice early morning light, you really see the, the silvery highlights yeah. and, and you can, you know, the wrong light, you might not see it, um, but it's certainly there and it shows beautifully in the good light. So this is a bird sitting on the water and it gives us a, a great ability to um, see that dark bull. And we'll come back to the dark bull because I yeah. think it's quite important when we come to to things like the flesh-footed shear water. Yeah, um, there's a few other things. A few other things that that um, that separate those, um, and and that's a, a classic photo of of the silvery underwings. So um, it, you can see really nice early morning light um, when the birds um, flying alongside the boat um, as they turn, um, really pronounced um, silver under those wings. Yeah, and I think yeah, that, especially the right end, it shows it quite nicely. The, the really long sharp. You mean wings. John's photo is better than mine. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it shows the really long um, sharp yes. wings of a um, of a city uh, or of the shear water in water. general, yeah. yeah. So definitely more flappers. Yeah, um, they don't yeah. have the same um, ability to load their wings. When, yeah, exactly. When they're yeah. Um, all right, and and um, I, I really included these photos just to show that they fly so low over the water, and it's that typical um, shear water sort of yep. flight. Shearing the water. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All right, and now we're moving away from the really common stuff and we, we're getting to birds that, that you don't see that often. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm very sad never to have seen a, a fleshy. Okay. So I don't talk from a lot of experience, but I've, I've de definitely um, worked my way through quite a lot of photographs. So maybe Dom, you can tell us what your key features are. I, I included this picture of John's because you can see the, the nice fleshy feet, although it's not, it's not a distinctive characteristic. Yeah, so that's it. not really something you would look for. If you try to look for the, the flesh colored feet, you're going to battle most times. I mean, often they hide it under the feathers. Under the feathers. They tuck it in under the feathers when they fly. So definitely not a feature to look out for. But the, the, the best feature is really that bill. So the it's a pale sort of horn colored bill with that dark tip, a very obvious dark tip. So same as you would be looking for between a spectacled and a white chin petrol. Yes. With spectacled having that dark bill tip. Uh, same, same thing. So would you be looking for on this um, and actually, white and petrel, which we're not going to be talking about today, but it's a, it can be a very similar species. So it's got the pale bill. So sooty shearwater shows the all dark bill. So it shouldn't really be mistaken for a sooty shearwater. But um, you can get these, you know, smaller looking white and petrels, which um, should have an entirely white bill yes, yes. compared to the dark tip here of the. Um, I mean, another thing we'll talk about when, when we look at it compar comparably to uh, wedge tail shearwater is it's actually quite a chunky shearwater. Yeah, it's, it's a stocky kind of, bird. It's, it's a more heavy set. Um, and I've seen a number of birds. I mean, I think we're going to show some photographs. Um, yeah, so again, so just that, that bill, it's very obvious. But this, I mean, that right hand bird shows it nicely. They can show almost a wedge shaped tail at times, particularly when, when it's fanned out. Um, but never as much as a as a wedge tail, and it's and that's when you really need to look at the um, 
just the general build of the birds, so much stockier birds, broader wings. Compared to photos coming up yeah. now as well. But that's why I wanted to mention the, 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 the essentially the build of the birds. Fleshies are, are actually very chunky. Yeah, I mean, approaching a white chimpetrel yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, it's quite bull-headed over here. You can see that um, mm -hmm. thick neck. But just looking at that, that pale bull with the dark tip, um, there's that small point to to the tail. Yeah. It's quite a, a bulky bird. Doesn't have um, that that uh, silvery underwings. So and you can actually see the, the flesh flesh feet, flesh, flesh feet there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, your your confusion species of a fleshy are, are wedge-tailed, yeah. um, uh, sooty shearwater, and and even as you said, something like a, a white and petrel because of its, yeah, it's so. like, Okay. All right. So those those are the the, the pointed tail tip, and and now we'll move on to uh, wedge-tailed, um, and I think. Uh, I mean, this is this is a bird. This is a, a bird of the tropics. Yeah. Um, so once again, it's it's not a bird that you see um, that often in our in our on our winter pelagics. It's probably more of a, a bird you'll see off, on a Durban pelagic. Yeah. So I mean, wedge-tailed is extremely rare in the subregion. Yeah. Just about all of our records are from Mozambique, although it have actually been a couple down in, off the Cape. Um, so it is definitely more of a tropical species, which is similar to flesh -footed. So flesh footed, they get quite regularly off Durban and we get the odd, odd bird down in the Cape. Okay. Um, yeah, so definitely more of a, of a tropical species. And this, I mean, it's a lovely shot, but it, it shows that, that really long elongated tail, you know, wedge shaped tail, um, which a, a flesh footed would never show, yes. you know, that degree of, um, of a long pointed tail. So I've got, a, I've got two of John's shots coming up here now, um, and this is something that we, we should be highlighting, is that there is a pale morph um, of the wedge-tailed shearwaters, which brings in a whole suite of additional confusions. Yeah. So, so the paler um, shearwaters, like a Manx, for example, or yeah. tropical shearwater, but it is a, a bigger bird than that. It's a bigger bird, and I mean, it looks you know, similar-ish to a great shearwater, that yeah. bird of morass yeah. has got that... Um, Dusky coloration. It doesn't have a dusky belly patch, yeah. or regularly. But it's got at least. all this uh, dirty coloring yeah. under, under the wings and, and the, the auxiliaries as well. Yeah, and that's when, if you look at the the rump, as in this, um, the left hand image, of, that's a pale morph from the left okay. there, yeah. which shows the all dark rump, yeah. which a uh, um, which the great the great has got that white yeah. crescent. All right, and then I mean these are these are some fantastic shots from from John, um, just showing. Really, the, the firstly the two color morphs, yeah. um, and you've got that um, very obvious tapered tail. So that's quite different to to that uh, flesh footed that we were looking at now. Yeah, um, the tail really does have that very um, long tapered, elongated look. And I guess you could get confused if the bird's turning and it fans its tail. That's when you're maybe not going to pick up the tapering. Yeah, so that's again when you're taking one image versus yeah. taking a, a sequence, a sequence of images. You can really pick that out. Um, and yeah, we've had one as far as I'm aware, one. Um, Pale morph wedge tail shear water really? off uh, Riches Bay or Durban okay. uh, from a few years back. And then something we haven't really talked about yet is the, the bill. Yes, I was so, about to mention that. Yeah, so it's it can be very variable. So it should never be as pale as a flesh footed shear water, which is that really that, that pale pinky coloration yeah. with a very obvious dark tip. Uh, so it can sort of be between a sooty shear water mm -hmm. and a and a flesh footed. You can yes. sort of intermediate between the two. And it does uh, often show that dark tip. Right. It's so more can, a subtle dark tip. You can see in these in these two images, yeah, she has a dark tip, and this one doesn't really have a dark tip. Yeah. And, and I guess it could be dependent on the light that you're getting on the on the bull as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a couple more um, photos. Um, once again, all, all John's picks. So that's another so, pearl morph on the right. Yeah, so it's a pearl morph, yeah, and and it, it might even be the same bird. Um, and you can see there's there's a, an obvious uh, dark tip too. Yeah, I mean a less dark obvious tip. dark tip on the right hand bird. Yeah. Um, and there's really long wings. Um, and I was quite say, delicate yes. looking, uh, well not delicate, but uh, more elongated um, structure to it. And I think we've got comparison shots between man and flesh footage here. Yeah. So there you go, quite, I mean, superficially they look quite similar, yeah. but I guess if you had to see them alongside each other, uh, that really, really long wings on a, um, on a wedge tail, and, and again, that really long tail, um, compared to the stocky board of, the, yeah. of a um, flesh footed approaching a petrol. Yeah. And thank goodness for John, because otherwise I'd have had yeah. no shots of these birds. Um, all right, so that's the point we're trying to make. It's a much slighter build than the, than the flesh-footed shearwater. All right, and I think that that wraps up um, uh, flesh-footed and, and wedgie. And now we move on to the slightly smaller and <laughs> really impossible to photograph yeah. um, smaller shearwaters. This is not quite um, the smallest, but um, these manx shearwaters. Um, I've seen, um, I think, two manx in, in my, my pelagic trips. 
Um, it's a it's a bird that you do see, but it's uh, it's always very quick, and yeah. uh, seldom do you get a chance to photograph it. And I'm not quite sure how John managed these pics, um, but um, very very quick. And and they're birds that are not necessarily seen where the trawlers are. Yeah, they're that gets often, similar to a sooty. It's yeah. that, that zone after you. I mean, talking from the Cape, after you pass Cape Point and head out for the next few kilometers, that, that's that's your. That's your time to get a Manx. Your window. And you've really got to be quick. Once Manx is shouted, it's normally just a two or three yeah. second view and they're gone. So for those people that um, get exhausted by all the birding at the canyon and are on their way back, and sorry, we're referring to the birding off, off Cape Point, um, but when the boat is chugging back to, to the harbour, when um, when people are nodding off, it's a good time to just uh, keep, keep out to yeah. look for these Manx. So what are some of the features of, of a, a Manx, Tom? Okay, so it's, it's a black and white um, shearwater. And uh, probably, so once you've got it down to a black and white shearwater, so the best feature is that pale crescent on the, on the ear coverts, on the cheek. And it, it really does, as I think all our images will show, it really does stand out. Uh, and if you've got any decent image, you should be able to pick, pick that out. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a, more he it's a heavy, uh, heavier built bird than a, than a little or a southern tartic. Yeah. The longer bull as well. Yeah, it does. Is, yeah, it's a very, very long bull for, yeah. for the size bird that it is. Um, I mean, I mean, tropical shearwater can be similar size, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. But again, it's it's got that um, that pale crescent on the on the cheek, yeah. on the ear coverts, and it should stand out. All right. So here are some some shots, and and as you can see, even even a photo of a bird sort of going away, um, it's got that very obvious white crescent. And the other feature, I don't know if you've mentioned it yet, is these dark trading edges to, to use white. No, I didn't the actually, no. Yeah. So when, when we go on to, um, on to especially the little shearwaters, yes. little and subantarctic, uh, they show that very, very thin black trading edge to the wing. Um, and uh, I mean, just out of interest, so it's called a Manx shearwater because it breeds on the Isle of Man. Uh, okay. And if, you've, if you're from the Isle of Man, you are a Manx. Okay. So that's, that's, that's I was actually going to ask you, but I don't want to um, sort of spot. put you on the spot. Yeah. But thanks for for telling us. So they are they they don't exclusively breed on. No, island. so they breed on a lot of the, um, I guess, North Sea islands, a lot of the European um, offshore islands. And once again, it's a summer a summer visitor to to our shores. It is, but they they pretty much stay year round. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they do peak in the summer months. But you you do stand a chance seeing them year round. They do there's a few birds which hang around. Okay, great. And then um, obviously we we highlighted. Let's just have a look at that amazing shot from John before we mess it up with a, with a, a red circle. But yeah, um, I don't. Uh, I asked a lot of people for photographs of a Manx shearwater, and John was the only one who, who had anything that is not only half decent. It's really awesome. So there's that uh, white crescent, which really is a very obvious uh, feature. As you yeah, suggested. and then the it shows it here. I mean, that's that bird's in direct sunlight. And you can you can still make out the dark trailing edge to the yeah. to the wing there, and I mean you should be able to tell them apart from the little shearwaters and on size. But then, as we saw on flock at sea, when you're oh, you know, thirty meters different. above the above the surface, everything looks the same. And when you've got little ones and southern Arctic shearwaters on the mind, you, you try to turn anything into it. Yeah. And uh, as we I, did on a I, few I, of those, I, I was I was one of those. I, I got very excited about a, a little shearwater. Um, but it turned out to be to be a, yeah. a Manx. All right, so let's talk about these two small ones. Um, these are the the really small um, shear waters, and yeah. and they're best dealt with together because yeah. uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, this is also a relatively recent split. Yeah, I think mean, the last you know, 15, 20 years okay. they split, and it was previously just called a little shear water. It was a little shear water before, and it's I mean, what are we given the rarity score here? Is it yeah, so, seven or eight? Um, I mean, they actually used to be, they used to pick them up a lot more regularly off the Cape, yeah. I know, 10, 15 years ago. I don't know what's changed. Um, I mean, we're doing just as many, if not more, pelagics. But um, May, June, April, May, June seems to be the window for these birds. Um, but they have dried up a little bit of late. There were a couple records, I think, of Subantarctic shearwater on Pocket Sea. Um, uh, no, there was a, there was was a little, single little. It was yeah, a little. There was a single okay. record of little. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from that, there hasn't been many records in, in recent years yeah. in the subregion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's quite interesting. Um, the legendary Barry Rose um, was was well known for picking up little shearwaters um, yeah. from from Cape Point, actually land based 
pelagic watching. So yes, he did, and I think him and John had a group of six birds. Of, I think it was little. Yeah, was maybe it? John can can put it in the chat room and, and tell us um, about uh, some of that reminiscing about little shearwaters yeah. off Cape Point. And Callan um, Cohen recently had a seven tartic shearwater off. That's right. Uh, off the west off, coast, off, off Scarborough. 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 Yeah. So they are around, but uh, it's certainly not easy birds. Yeah. So, I mean, you can see from this, and this is something I didn't know before, is they, they do tend to have quite um, different breeding ranges. So little seems to breed um, in the you know, Australasia, Australasia, yeah. Australasian region. And then um, Tristan um, and sort of the Falklands is where sub, sub-Antarctic breeds are. I know there's, there's obviously some um, breeding yes. islands over here, but um, that's obviously their separation in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, yeah. in the Southern Ocean. All right, so um, this is, uh, I guess, um, Dom, having trying to try to find decent photographs of these birds on the internet, they are very, very poorly photographed because they're so quick and difficult yeah. to, to photograph um, at sea. Um, obviously, this is a bird in hand. I, I think that's your, your shot of the sub-Antarctic. Yeah, so that's on Nightingale Island. So that's on the Tristan de Cunha archipelago. Uh, and it shows nicely the, yeah. uh, the dark cheeks and the dark cap yeah. standing there. So that's your that's your key feature and probably your one and only feature with these with these two birds yeah, separating. It's, 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 it's that, that whitish face for little, um, and the dark face for for sub Antarctic, and and I'm going to show you the, um, <laughs> the lousy shots that I got off the internet. Um, the, the the one is uh, the one on the left is obviously little, and the one on the right is, is sub Antarctic. And even in those photos, you can actually see um, that feature. Quite clear, the, yeah. the, the different uh, amount of white on, on the face, and it's often not that clear cut. So you, as with anything, you get these um, sort of intermediate birds yeah. which you don't quite know where to where to put. So once again, it's it's a it's a classic um, it's a classic methodology of mine. If you're not a hundred percent sure, you just tick both. Uh, like <laughs> yeah. If you, yeah. if you the one you need, you're the one you need. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's a good way to do it. All right. So that that kind of wraps up the. The more common, and I guess little and subantarctic shearwaters are, are not common birds, yeah, but the more yes. regularly occurring. And then, if yeah. you're on a pelagic trip in South Africa, Southern Africa, you can probably be looking out for for those shearwaters. We'll come to the really rare ones in a in a second. So John's just commented. He said they had uh, a very memorable sea watch. There's 13 sightings with six individuals at one stage. Jesus. Wow, and that was exceptional. And and that's little, or was that um, pre-split? Uh, he doesn't say. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, all right, so thanks, Dave. Um, uh, anything else in the chat room that's worth uh, raising at this stage? Nothing. Okay. All right, let's let's move on to um, the storm petrels, and and we'll we'll talk through the the more common ones. Um, this is one of the most numerous birds on the planet. Uh, very widespread, um, occurs just about everywhere, um, and is is a bird that you would expect to see. Mind you, we we went out a couple of weeks back and and saw one that, that dreadful photo I had earlier on. Yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, it's bizarre. You can go out and it, there can be hundreds, thousands of them around the boat. And that's when you, you, know, you pick through them looking for these rare storm petrels. Or you can go out and not see a single one. And I don't, know, don't quite know what it is, but uh, that's just how it goes, really. And I mean, Wilson's is your the generic storm petrel of, uh, of South Africa or Southern Africa. Um, so it's probably what you can assume most storm petrels are, unless you can tell yeah, otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then what you're looking for here is so probably European storm petrel is our confusion species. Yeah, and, and sort of next most common storm petrel. And you're looking at the toes extending beyond the tail. And and I mean we've all storm petrels that are quite similar to little swift. So if you see yeah. a little swift out at sea, you're probably seeing a storm petrel. Yes. So that those dark bodies with a white run. Um, right. So let's let's look at those features just in these um, these photographs. So you've got that toe projection. Yeah. Um, so when we come to European storm petrel, we'll show the, the difference there. But very obvious um, trailing toes behind the, the base of the tail. Um, and then the other feature is the, the underwings. Um, Wilson's has got dark underwings, and we'll yeah. come to European, which has got um, pale flashes and underwings. Yeah. Um, and then um, the, the wraparound of the, the, the rump. Um, yeah, as it shows in this um, central image, it, you know, it goes probably almost to half of the vent yes. is covered in white. Whereas most of the other confusion pairs are show much less white wrapping around. All right, so that's Wilson's, and that's a bird that you'd expect to see. There's another great shot um, showing that. Also, we didn't mention the the, the, the sort of the paler uh, okay, the patches on the yeah. paler carpal patches on the on the upper wings. Yeah. So if you look at a 
a European, it shows it's, it's a much darker, darker bird, more and uniform. We've got some shots showing that in a sec. So here's a uh, European and immediately you can see um, the less extensive white wrapping around. Um, you can actually see the toe projection there is, is not um, substantially beyond the tail. Yeah. Um, and then obviously that, that white flash um, on the underwings. And, and this, this is a bird, this is a bird we see in summer here. Yeah, and it, it's a smaller bird also. It, it seems a lot more compact to me than a, than a Wilson Storm Petrel. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you watch it, you can generally pick out that white, the white underwing flashes quite easily. Yeah. But it can take a little while yeah. watching a bird until you really catch it in the light, similar to a sooty shield. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so there's um, just uh, some of uh, Francie's images. Um, and and he has, he has a, a, a good comparison shot. Um, so obviously, just to avoid confusion, Wilson Storm Petrel in the middle, and that's a shot from the previous section. Um, and there's the, the European storm petrel on the right and on the left and, and very clearly see um, the difference in the toe projection. Um, and then the upper wings, um, European seems to be a lot more uniform um, with uh, Wilson's having that, that pale carpal patch. Yeah. And I mean, it's not generally a, a feature which you need to use. If you've seen the bird well enough, you know, you can go first off with the white underwing, white underwing and then with the toe projection. Um, but um, it is a feature. Yeah. Okay, and there's that that white underwing, and that that really is obvious in in good uh, in very good light. Yeah. All right. Okay, and then the next um uh, the next one that we we find regularly, but very specific passage migrants. So yeah, I'm a bird that that comes through our waters. Um, I think in in uh, April May. Yeah, so um, late April May, and then again in October. October. Generally, the first two or three weeks in October. Yeah. Um, and so you'll find that there's a a big rush to get onto a pelagic trip in in those uh, weeks in October. Yeah, um, and I think I've actually signed up for a, a pelagic in that window because I'd like to see one of these this year. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a very cool bird to see because yeah. you don't see them that often. And yeah, I mean, if you don't do pelagics in those windows, you, you don't see them. Yeah. Uh, whereas start all the other birds, you got a chance, but pretty much outside of the two windows, you got you got no chance of these birds. So I mean, it's it's. Quite, um, quite an easy one to pick up because it's really the most um, obvious, regular white-bellied yeah, storm petrel. So European and Wilsons don't have these white bellies. The only white-bellied, and I'm, I'm referring black-bellied as a white-bellied storm petrel as well, it's black-bellied, white-bellied, and gray, gray, gray bat. bat. Yep. Um, so those are the three options that you've got, and, and I think um, two of those would make you almost fall out of the boat. Yeah. Um, so generally, your, your white-bellied bird's going to be a, a black-bellied storm petrel. That yep. sounds quite... Um, what a weird way to say that, but um, the difficulty here is you do get black bellies that have entirely white bellies, and there's some very subtle features there. I don't know if we're going to go into too much detail. Yeah, we'll sort of talk over it very briefly, but um, yeah, you get these birds, Milena Luca, um, which breed on the uh, just in the Cunha group, yeah. uh, and these are white bellied, black bellied storm petrels. So uh, I think we show some slides a little bit, some photographs a little bit later on. Uh, but when you got your, your typical um, tro trop tropicalis um, subspecies, which shows the, the dark um, band on central, the central, central stripe, stripe. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Occasionally, if you've got a bird square on, you might not see it. Yeah. It often looks like you're, you're looking at the, um, the black as the, the sea surface behind it, and you think the white has ended. But um, generally, it's, it's not too difficult to see. Um, but it's when you get those um, Lana Luca. Um, subspecies from Tristan, where it uh, looks almost identical to a to a white, to a white bead, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about the the separation features. This plain white rump. We'll we'll pause that for a second because we'll come back to it in, in a moment with uh, with white bellied. So here's um, here's white bellied, um, and um, I, I guess uh, probably not John's uh, best pelagic bird photo, but I think it really depicts um, the bird extremely well. I mean, I, I know you you'd kind of battle to. Um, eliminate a, a white belly, black belly on this photo, yeah. but it's, it's a really cool shot seeing. I mean, I think if I saw that um, on a Cape Pelagic, I might, as I say, fall out of the boat. Yeah. Um, so um, it's got those, in fact, it's quite interesting because one of the features to separate the white bellied form of black bellied is a, a U-shaped, um, this U-shaped white. Mm -hmm. and, and in this photo, you can even see that this bird has got that U-shape, which, which eliminates the, the black bellied, which is yeah. a, a much squarer um, vent. Right, so here's um, what you're looking for. And um, the differences uh, on the upper side are extremely subtle. So we've got a really nice shot that you've, you've shared with us as well. So this is, 
just a, a normal white bellied, and you can see the, the U shape in the vent over here. Um, and that's a typical Which is also black bellied. It's quite subtle. It is quite subtle. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're dealing in margins here. Yeah. Um, uh, the toe projection. So that's a, another feature. You've got, just like Wilson's and European, black bellied's got um, a toe projection beyond the tail tip. Yeah, uh, so not the best feature, but generally they do have shorter toe projection than a black bellied storm petrel. Yeah. Um, you know, of that um, white bellied, black bellied. And then this is, this is um, I, I think, possibly the most subtle feature we've ever discussed on our, our series of webinars. Is these, yeah. little, these little dark feathers in, in the, the white um, rump of a white bellied storm yes. petrel. So it's really, <laughs> once you've got the birds <laughs> in the hand, you okay. can really get to grips with this feature. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they do show these little dark tips, which um, so the, the tips we, in case it's not many. incredibly obvious to everybody, it's these little dark tips in these um, yeah, white and the red 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 feathers, and there's some dark tips over here. Whereas when you're talking about a black bellied, um, they are extremely clean white feathers, but very very subtle. Yeah. And as you say, it's something that you want to have the bird in your hand. And one of the best ways is to hope that you get a bird from Australasia which does show a much grayer back. And if we can go yeah, back here. Yeah, there you go. So this Grolaria subspecies, it shows this pale mantle. Yeah, and well. especially when you, you're blowing out your, um, your, uh, your pale images, it, it shows that, that feature yeah. quite nicely. But it's, um, yeah, I've seen these birds coming back from Tristan de Cunha. Uh, we've had quite a few white bellied coming past. And it actually was quite a good feature, even, even shows it even paler than, than uh, okay, shown here, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a bird I'd love to see, but uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long shot. All right, and now, um, you know, leech storm petrel. Um, so also uh, really tough to see. Um, so just to, to, to be clear, white-bellied storm petrel is not a regular occurring storm petrel. And, yeah. and leeches, I think they, they're more numerous than white-bellied, but it's also a bird that you don't see very often in the subregion. Yeah, and, and interestingly, they actually do breed of uh, South Africa. So on yes, uh, is it, right. uh, Dawson Island, yes. yep. I think it's about six pairs, yeah. which are still breeding even now. Yeah. Um, and it's quite bizarre. It's a Northern Hemisphere breeding bird, but there's a few birds which have decided to, 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 over, to breed down here. Yeah. Breed. So, and it's, it's not a bird you regularly got, get on Cape Pelagics, but it is a bird you can get. And as you go further out into the oceanic waters, you can see these birds. Um, so the obvious feature when you straight away look at it, and there are some confusion species, the really rare stuff, but yeah. it's this, uh, this fork tail, um, almost a swallow tailed type of bird. Yeah, with a white rump. With a white rump, yeah. yeah. Unless you get the rare dark rumped morph, which brings in a whole lot of confusion with swallows yeah. and metadiras. So, yeah, and I don't think we've ever had one down here, a dark morph bird. Um, but they do show, excuse me, intermediates between that entirely dark rump and then that entirely white rump. They often show this white so this dark line through the runs, yes. as in that top right bird. Um, and, and quite a long winged bird, as these images, you see that right hand image shows quite nicely. It's, it's, a, it's a larger storm petrel than the yeah. Wilson's in Europe. Yeah. They often, they've got a different flight action. They often fly a little bit higher above yeah. the surface than some of the other ones, which you know, puts a patter above the, above the ocean. Um, but yeah, it, it does appear quite long winged. Okay, so there's the fork tail, um, the, the white rump marginally folding over. Um, and, and that brings us on to um, the vagrant stuff. And I think just I think it's useful to show some of these images, but we're not going to go into too much detail here. No. These are birds that, um, just in the interest of time, we we we, we don't need to spend too long on these. And um, so this this bird is uh, another one of John's shots. This is a uh, Matsudaras, um, and there's some very obvious features which we'll talk about uh, when you look at that image. Now that I've spent some time looking at these things, it is quite obvious that. It is a Machidaris, yeah. um, separating it from a few. So the first is the shearwaters. This is a street shearwater. This is a bird of sort of um, um, Australasia. Um, and yeah, it's a specific the Western Asian Pacific, bird, really. Yeah. Um, and, and a very pale-headed bird compared to the shearwaters. Yeah, you. so it's got the, so Corey's and Scopoli show this uniform brown uh, so forehead, whereas it shows a streaking in the forehead. It's got uh, these um, dark uh, underwing coverts to the primaries there, which, um, which Corey's and Scopoli's don't, don't have, show. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, those features, particularly the, um, the face yeah. should-, should um, yeah, So when the bird's front on, up. I've seen some images of the bird front on, it almost looks like a leucistic lucus, yeah. um, sort of uh, Corey's. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think there's probably two records. Uh, of something like something that, like yeah. That. It's a very rare bird. Um, all right, so there's the, 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 the very pale head and you can see 
in, in this image over here, it, it looks almost like it's leucistic. Yeah. Um, and short tail shearwater. So once again, um, this is a new bird um, in Sassel 5. Um, yeah. And that was your, your record, Dom. Yeah, so that is a bird off um, about 150k south of Cape Point, okay. off uh, Cape Agalis or on the Agalis Bank there. And uh, I mean, very, very similar to uh, sooty shearwater. It's a sister, sister species and almost identical, and a lot of birds can't be told, you know, told Separate, apart. Yeah. Um, but it's got this, um, it's a slightly smaller bird, so the, the length of the tail is not a feature. Um, but if you've got, it's got this uh, quite, um, it doesn't have a sloping forehead on the sooty shearwood. It's got quite a... Uh, you can see that in this image. Yeah. It's got a very um, sort of up, um, uh, sharp forehead. Yeah, I think that's probably the word I was looking for. And yeah. a, a slightly shorter bill. Yeah. It's got a more delicate bill than a sooty shearwater. And uh, there are subtle differences in the underwing patterning of the, the you know, the, the, um, the silvery highlights. Um, but it's and, and when you picked up this bird, is it a bird that you photographed and you thought it looked a little bit odd? Um, because it's so difficult to tell when you... Yeah, so it. it looks slightly smaller to me. And then it's, um, it is really this uh, the forehead which forehead. Stood, out, stood out, even when I first picked it up. Um, and yeah, the, the combination of that, that steep forehead and, and the shorter bill. I mean, sooty shearwaters can occasionally fluff up their forehead and, and it can, it can, be, look, it can yeah. look steep. But then you get a few photographs and it's, you know, it's flattened its, flat its feathers again. But very, very tricky. All right, so there's some, uh, some uh, all these features that we mentioned, the steep forehead, the shorter bill, um, tail length, not uh, a feature. Not a feature, yeah. And here's Balearic, this is um, your parents' shot, um, and really not gonna um, touch on this one too much, this is an extremely rare bird. Um, it's got uh, sort of this- It's critically endangered, so only they... breeding in Mediterranean, and yeah. down to a few hundred pairs left. Uh, but yeah, basically just a, a more, washed out sooty shearwater. Yeah. It's very, very similar to, to those birds with okay. a very long bill, um, okay. which is a good feature. Right, and then uh, tropical shearwater? Yeah, so birds are picking up, up off Durban fairly regularly, just about one a year now. Um, so quite similar to a Manx shearwater, but it doesn't show that white crescent in the, in the ear covers. It's got that dark trailing edge, so you should be able to, to the underwing. So you should be able to tell it apart from a little or a sub yeah. um, And just about all our records are white vented birds, but you do get birds from the Seychelles, I believe, yeah. which show these, these dark vents, so the Nic Nicolae and uh, Nicolae subspecies, subspecies yeah. yeah. Right, but I think that's, that white crescent really is a feature that you, you, you don't yeah, see. Yeah, slightly smaller than a Manx, but uh, very subtle. Yeah. And then uh, greyback storm petrel, um, and I think the, the quicker we go past this one, the better for some people that are listening. Um, there's a very, very sad story um, uh, about a greyback storm petrel. Um, someone was unfortunately not well enough to go on a pelagic and therefore missed it, but um, we will move on very fast. But yes, yeah, so a, a very pale bird, um, rump and back. Um, it's, it's, as we said, one of the white-bellied birds. Yep. Um, an in interesting feature here is these um, streets. Yeah, almost um, reminiscent of a New Zealand storm petrel. Correct, yes. Uh, but you know, I mean, it, the best feature is really that grey back and rump. Yeah. And um, once you see um, the upper parts, it's really, you shouldn't mistake it for much else. Yeah, but uh, very, very few records in our Yeah, I think less than 10. Less than 10, as much as that. Yeah, yeah, five or six maybe. All right, and um, there's the, the features we've spoken about. There's uh, this variable amount of streaking, as you said, like a New Zealand storm petrel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the gray rump and that sort of very pale um, uh, sort of upper back. Covered, yeah. And then um, this is also an amazing bird. And I know um, Neil's had uh, good success with these on, on Durban pelagic. So this yeah. is uh, obviously a bird that does drift into sort of the most big channel and, and is seen occasionally off Durban. Yeah, and I think in, in Mozambique waters, I know Cliff Dorse had it was 12 records okay. uh, heading down the Mozambique uh, channel in Mozambique waters. So they're, they're probably not as rare as they are reported, yeah. just that nobody's looking up there. And it really is a very distinctive looking bird, just so pale. It's got that pale face yeah, I mean, which stands you, out. You put all these, um, all these schedules together and, and you, you don't have anything as a confusion species. Yeah. You can kind of see why. It's a, it's a very obvious bird. When yeah, and it's got these very long legs know, also. It's like kangaroo. Yeah. And he's even bouncing on the water, you know, over the water. Have you seen one of these? Yes, in, yeah. In, in the sub-region or? Yeah, I've been lucky to a couple, yeah. 
yeah. So it's, but those long legs are, are really almost comical. Uh, yeah, it's sense. quite a strange looking dude. All right, so that's white face storm petrol, and and we're getting to the the, the really the, the really outlandish stuff now. This is uh, Bandrumpton. I think they are. Um, I think this is a relatively new bird for our. Yeah, our I think there's one record now for uh, the subregion, which is off Halifax Island of Namibia. Uh, very very similar to Wilson's. It's a slightly larger bird, more heavily built, and it's got these long wings. So yeah. you can actually see in these photographs, see that bottom one there. She has those long, fairly broad wings. It looks like a bigger bird than, than Wilson's. Yeah. And obviously it doesn't have that toe projection and the slightly notched tail. So yeah. Quite a few features that you can pick up upon. But yeah, but gee, it must be tricky when you're working for you know, hundreds, thousands of Wilson's, small yeah. petrels. And I know um, Rob Leslie, when he was on that, on that uh, boat off Namibia, I know he spent a lot of time looking for these because yeah. that seems to be where they've been seen. But um, he only managed to get them much further north when, when he was just off, off the coast of... So off the bulge, basically, yeah. I think he, he got them there. All right, and then um, two more left. Um, swinnows. Um, this is uh, this is a bird that uh, I guess many of our less experienced pelagic uh, listeners may never have heard of, um, but it's also a very very rare bird um, in our waters. Yeah, so mostly from again Pacific waters. I think they breed off is it Japan. Yes, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so but they are. There's been a few records now in Mozambique waters in the Mozambique Channel, um, so they do probably occur more regularly than we, than we know. And there's actually a few, they might actually be breeding in the, um, of Europe. There's been okay. a few birds banded there in amongst the storm petrel uh, colonies there. So there may be a few birds breeding up there too. So it's, it's bird maybe at one point will get off the west coast of South Africa. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a large, basically all dark storm petrel. It shows those pale flashes in the in the upper wing coverts. Yeah. Uh, it's got the very small tick mark in the upper, in the, the tops of the primaries, which uh, the next species will show, Matsudera, shows a much stronger yeah. or obvious uh, white um, primary base. It's got this forked tail, uh, but not as heavily forked as Matsudera's. And these two sister species can be re really tough to tell apart. And when you got classic birds, it's, it's easy, but you get these intermediates, which... This, uh, it, it must be absolutely terrible to see one of these two in our waters and not be able to pin it yeah, down. Yeah, you know you've got an absolute mega, <laughs> but you, you, you don't just, know which you one. You not yeah. be able to pin it down. So make sure that camera is focused. Yeah, um, yeah and I, I mean, this is as subtle as it is. It's, uh, you talk about these pale um, sort of flashes in the wings not reaching yeah. um, the leading edge of the wing, whereas Matsudara does have that feature. Yeah, but it it's must very be subtle. so yeah. difficult to see. Depending on the light and, and all sorts of things. All right, so here's Matsudaris, and, and as you said, these, um, these white um, uh, sort of bases to these primary feathers is, is yeah, quite it's a lot more like a Nike obvious. tick yeah. Um, yeah. in the you know, bases of the primaries. And mm. so nice deep fork to the tail there, you can see it. it's a really obvious fork there. And it's, it's a big bird. Um, so I think we, I don't know if we have that photograph of the great wing petrel alongside it at, no, at some point, we don't, I, but it's... Uh, that, that was really too bad to include. That's one of your worst shots, I have to say. So. <laughs> your best <laughs> what are your yeah. best? Well, in fact, it was the quiz shot, and then we agreed that it was so bad that it was even too difficult for the quiz. But it's it's a big bird, so it's I've got this great shot of mine, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which shows it alongside a black a black belly storm petrel, and it's twice twice the size of oh, the black belly. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's a big storm petrel. Um, if I was, if I was more time. on things, I could sc <laughs> scroll through my computer and get it, but I'm not going to, it could ruin no, all. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, yeah, so, I mean, a, a very, uh, and, and just in this photograph, you can see that extremely subtle yeah. um, paler upper wings just actually going reaching, to, yeah. to the, the leading edge of the wings. And so, they might often be in shadow there, yeah. so it's, it's not a great feature. Yeah, it of shows the, it here a bit better in Francie's illustrations, and that really deep uh, fork tail is just about the best feature, really. And to separate the two, and I think that's I think that's it. Storm petals, yeah. That's that's the that's the I think twenty one shearwaters and storm petrels that we promised we'd bring to our, our, our participants. Oh, um, just, over an hour. just over an hour, um, and and all that's left to do. There's a couple of formalities we need to get through, but you know, we've covered a, a hell of a lot of pelagic birds. Um, I think there there are a few uh, great things to say. Is one is that. Uh, pelagic trips are now back on on the map um, yep. so so all the pelagic birding companies are, are heading out to sea now and i think the the, the space is available because we don't have the foreigners yet yeah. so it's a good time to get out you know yeah, there's a lot of good birds out there so yeah. these birds have been hanging around all season there's a few formers out there there's a gray-headed old the transcripts yeah. are still showing 
Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, we're all so keen to get out that uh, it's, it's just a lot of hours out yeah. there. So um, if you can get down to Cape Town or get to, to Durban or even, I know there was a trip that went off uh, Port Elizabeth, um, try get out to sea um, because now you have all the knowledge you need. Um, the, the other thing is that um, Flock has been confirmed as 2022. So um, we definitely will be making our uh, webinars available pre-Flock so people can refresh. Um, and we, we, we hope that people will be making laminated copies of all the slides. We might have to make that available. Um, so that's another great thing. And, and then Dom, I just want to say a huge thanks to all the time and effort that you put into to joining us on these. The, the, we, when we said we were going to do a, a series of Logic webinars, I don't think you'd think it was going to be three months long. Um, so thanks for your patience and, and your participation. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, Mark. It's, yeah, it's been fun. I, I've learned, actually learned a lot. Yeah. You do every time you do these things. Um, and yeah, as it, I'm looking forward to spending a bit more time on the scene. Yeah, can't wait. And, um, and then it just comes to, to our, our final quiz. So Dave, I, I don't know how you've done with the, the, the quiz there. So we've got them up on the screen. So we've got um, A over here and we've got B over here and we've got C down here and D over here. And um, I don't know if you've got a winner. Have you got a winner that got them all right? Or should I, in fact, let me give the answers what are first. The answers, Mike? Let's give the answers yeah. first. Okay, so um, there's been quite a lot of criticism from a number of people on that uh, top left one. Um, it's Dom's really awful photo, um, but I think it's a pretty phenomenal photo given the species. And, and maybe Dom, just to talk about the features here. So it's, it's one of the little in Sub-Antarctic. I, yeah. I think the size of the birds, you can just see the compact shape. It's got a relatively short bill for one of these small yeah. black and white shearwaters. Um, and then how do we separate it between little and, and sub-Antarctic is you need to look at the, 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 the extent of white on the face. And, yeah. and when I look at that, even though it is a bit grainy and, and quite distant, to me, it looks like a, a much darker, darker hood than, than a little. Yeah. And so I, I'd be comfortable calling that a sub-Antarctic. Yeah, so that's, you, you know, your more classic looking birds. Um, and it, so it's got that dark, you know, dark cheeks and, and it really does, it shows quite obviously that um, you wouldn't really mistake that for a, for a little, I don't think. Yeah, no, uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, <laughs> so, and then the judge's decision is final, just for the record. Um, all right, so this is your shot, and, and you are very comfortable. It's a sub Antarctic, and I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, so, um, bird number B was uh, this one over here, and I think this was relatively easy. Um, it's one of the white bellied swarm petrels. So, yeah. you, you're talking about white bellied, black bellied, and, and, and obviously a, a gray backed. Yeah. Um, and you can actually see um, this dark brown central. Um, uh, stripe, belly stripe, um, yeah. belly stripe, and that uh, completely rules out uh, yeah. both of the other two. Yeah. So that that is clearly a black-bellied storm petrel. I don't think we'll get too many arguments on that one. This bird over here, um, it's a it's a shearwater. Um, so what are your options? Um, I suppose sooty shearwater, um, flesh-footed shearwater, wedge-tailed shearwater. I think you can rule out things like great shearwater. So of those three, um, it's got a a very pale bill with a dark tip, yeah. rules out sooty shearwater immediately. Um, and then I think just the, the shape of the bird, it's a... Uh, yeah, fairly broad wings, not yeah. as long uh, as a, a wedge-tailed. And it's I mean, quite a chunky well. Yeah, you could be forgiven for calling that a, a wedge-tailed. Wedge it does have quite a wedge to the tail, but um, not as much as should yeah. show in a it, wedge-tailed. Uh, and we, we did speak about the fact that these flesh-footed do have a pointed tail, yeah. and depending on how they fan it, it can look a little bit tapered. Yeah. Um, so this is a flesh-footed shearwater. Yep. And then the last bird is, uh, I think, the easiest of the lot. It's got that very prominent toe projection. Um, it's got that uh, little swift-like white rump. Yeah, which um, extends quite a long way around onto the vent. Yep, yeah. and so even though, and you can't see any white flashes on the underwings, so that rules out European storm petrel. Yeah, and um, the toes. And so we're left with a um, ordinary Wilson storm petrel. Yeah. So those are your, are your four answers. Um, and Dave, I think it's over to you to reveal some results. Did anyone get it right? Mike and the auditors have just finished their review. Okay. And uh, just tight and had some good submissions. Um, but the, the winner is John Graham. Hey. Well done, John. Jeez, I tell you, uh, what I do know is that uh, we need the heavy hitters to win, <laughs> win these quizzes. I'm so, so I need to leave also. That, uh, <laughs> that John agreed with your identification yeah, of the, the, the well, subject. So Okay, so, so um, but it would, what would be great is if you told us that Trevor called it a little shear water. That would be great. But um, we don't want to court controversy. Um, so congrats, John. It's great having you listening. You, you really are a legend in, in um, 
in pelagic birding in South Africa and your photos have been an absolute gift um, for us to run these things. We wouldn't have been able to do them without yeah, them. Yeah, those Pacific Ocean shots. Yeah. Yeah, incredible shots. Yeah. Fantastic. So thanks very much, John, for all the hard work you put in giving me some pics. Um, you're a well-deserved winner of um, the Cecil Five. So um, you know where Dom lives. Um, you can call him. He's got uh, a couple in his cupboard. Yeah. And I think that brings us to a close. Um, just our last slide is obviously to once again thank BirdLife South Africa for really helping us um, just expose uh, our webinars to the public. And we really appreciate their support and we, we do a lot of stuff together. Um, and we look forward to supporting Flock 2022 with, with maybe some of our ID um, webinars. Yeah. Dave, a goodbye from you as well. Yeah, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Fantastic. Uh... Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All right. Um, watch our um, our Facebook page, and and obviously um, we'll contact you on emails for for the next webinar. Um, we don't know what that's going to be yet, but we'll definitely make it something worthwhile. Uh, keep well, keep safe, and uh, see you soon. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Good night.